part of the reason why we had this, uh, we invited Robert to come give this talk is ClickHouse is one of these interesting systems that are out there that from an academic standpoint, uh, we don't know a lot about. Uh, and, but certainly the feature list that it, that it supports is very impressive. Um, so Robert is the CEO of a newish uh, startup out of uh, Berkeley, or I guess in the US, that is the commercial representation and um, I guess it, the company that's gonna be selling or backing ClickHouse outside of Yandex, which he will explain with, uh, what, that, what that means in a second. Um, prior to this, he was at VMware because he was at a, uh, he founded a startup called Continent that uh, was, was bought by VMware and he was the CEO there for, for almost nine years. Um, his background technically is not computer science. You have an undergraduate degree in medieval studies and then you have a master's degree uh, from University of Washington in, in Japanese international studies. So it's a very rare background, which is, which is awesome. You'd be surprised how useful it is in computer science. I read a lot of Cicero when I was in college. Nice. Okay. I, I, use, I use that more than computer science sometimes. OK, so the way we're going to do this, everyone, uh, so remain muted so there's no background noise uh, while Robert gives his presentation. Uh, but if you have a question, just unmute yourself and interrupt them. But then please also introduce who you are so that uh, you know, Robert and everyone knows you know, you know, who you are, right? Sound good? OK, Robert, the floor is yours. Go for it. All right. Thank you so much, Andy. Hey, it's a total honor to be here. Uh, we've been looking for opportunities to introduce ClickHouse to people in the academic community, particularly in the United States. So this is, this is just a, a true pleasure. And um, as you'll see, I'm kind of a database geek. Uh, I'm going to put some constraints on that to, so that you don't ask me questions I can't possibly answer. But I love databases. So if you have questions and you want to stay around and talk, I'm, I'm your man. Um, I love doing this stuff. What I'm going to be talking about then is ClickHouse, and the title is The Fastest Data Warehouse You've Never Heard Of. And the reason we give it that title is ClickHouse is pretty well known in other parts of the world, but is just beginning to really pick up steam in the United States and, um, and Western Europe. So what I'm going to do here is give a basic introduction uh, to the capabilities and the things that are really causing people to get excited about it. Let me move forward. All right, great. Slides are working. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, as Andy said, you know, I have this, this background. Really, I've been a, a hacker since I was a kid. Uh, I started with a on um, the Washtenaw commu Computing um, or Timesharing Service in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1972. The school I went to, uh, the science teacher thought that that we should learn how to program. So they bought like a Texas Instruments teletype. They had an audio coupler. Uh, and modem that ran 300 baud and a pink book that talked about this language called basics. So that's where I got started. I've been working on databases since uh, 1983, and that's what I've done for most of my professional career. Uh, they've included uh, everything from M204, that was the first one I started on, uh, through, I worked at Sybase for many years, I've worked, built a lot of apps on Oracle, SQL Server, and then um, all the way up to ClickHouse, which is uh, database approximately number 20. So the company I work for is called Altenity. As Andy said, we're a startup, and our goal is to offer enterprise software and services for ClickHouse, basically make enterprises in the United States and Western Europe in particular productive and successful on ClickHouse. Uh, beyond the business stuff that we do, we're a major committer um, and community sponsor in the US and Western Europe. So we participated in, uh, we only have, at the end of last year, we had 20 people on the team, or actually about 19. Uh, we participated in something like 16 events, of which many of which we sponsored ourselves, and uh, with the number two committer after Yandex to the ClickHouse server, as well as uh, ecosystem projects. So that's about us. Uh, for the rest of this, I want to dive in and talk about ClickHouse. But before I start talking about it, I'd like to do just a really short demo, which I think gives a sense of why people get so stoked about it. So. What I'm looking at right here is a screen that is pointed out, uh, uh, pointed, I'm um, SSH'd into a VM. It's running up in Amazon. It's got eight vCPUs, 32 gigs of RAM, and it is uh, using local NVMe SSD storage. So pretty good storage underneath it, but not a particularly powerful uh, VM beyond that. 
What I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump in and talk straight to ClickHouse. So this is a more or less bleeding edge uh, build that we're talking to. And what I'm going to do is I want to just do a very quick demo that gives you a sense of the speed of ClickHouse. And so the first thing I'm going to do in this demo is nothing to do with ClickHouse or nothing to do with, with queries. I'm going to do a setting that says, hey, use direct IO. So no cheating here, no, no reading pages out of the, the OS buffer cache. So we've set that. And now what I'm going to do is I have a, a data set with taxi data in it, and I'm going to go ahead and count the number of records in it. So let's go ahead and grab that command. And it's called trip data. I count it. It takes a fraction of a second, like one millisecond. And it gives us 1.3 billion rows. Now, the fact that I can do it in one millisecond is not very exciting because there's all kinds of ways that databases can cheat on counts. But all I wanted to do was find out, okay, how many records do I have in this table? And the reason I'm going to do that is I'm going to run a little experiment. I'm actually going to generate this many numbers and take their average. All right, let's get the number. So what I'm running here is a query that generates numbers out of a special table called system.numbers under bar MT. MT stands for multi-threaded, which means that we can, we can um, read them in a, in a parallel way. And what I did was I computed the average. So it's monotonically increasing, first number is one, and then it goes all the way up to 1.31 uh, billion. So here's the average. The important thing to note here is it took 1.162 seconds to get this result. So the question now is, suppose I go back to that taxi data set and I wanna know the average number of passengers per taxi ride. Do you think that that would be faster to do in the way that I just did where I did it purely in memory, everything on the CPU, or would it be faster to actually go and compute that average by scanning the real data set? So, Question, if anybody wants to throw in an answer, so in quick, memory or go to storage? Quick clarification, this, 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 the second query, the average here, this is a synthetic data set where you're just getting uh, a bunch of random numbers from- Yep, from, from just coming off a function, gotcha. a monotonically increasing uh, a set of numbers. Okay. <laughs> and so your question is, would it be faster to read from disk or read from memory for this? Or, or to do it right here, the way I did here where I read from memory. Hi, this is Steven from Yelp. I think the traditional data warehouse, they should keep a lot of uh, so maps and statistics. It should be faster than you have to actually generate all those numbers. So I'm saying faster. Okay. It's going to be faster, but not for that reason. So we actually, one of the things I did at the beginning was force this not to use any caches. So the only cache that we're actually going to use here is, uh, the only cache that we could use in this particular case is the OS buffer cache. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to run that average, and it's a brute force average where we're going to go out and read the data directly off the data set. So here we go. Bang. It gets done in 0.5 seconds. So you're absolutely right. It was faster, but the reason that it was faster was uh, twofold. One, ClickHouse is incredibly uh, parsimonious in the way that it stores data. So this was well compressed. Passenger counts are generally small numbers. So, you know, one, two, three, something that kind of bounce around there. We only use a byte for it, and then it's compressed on top of that. <clears throat> so that's reason number one, that, it's, that we're reading a relatively small amount of data. The second thing is that ClickHouse is incredibly efficient at parallelizing I.O. And uh, in this particular case, it turns out that ClickHouse is not so good at parallelizing that function that was generating the numbers. Um, and in fact, what happened was I was able to use all eight VCP, vCPUs, go out, read the data, assemble the aggregates, and put them together. So as a result, going straight out to the data was only half the time of, of working purely in memory. So that's sort of an illustration, and this is just brute force uh, a table scan that's doing this. The question that we always ask in, in ClickHouse is, can we make it faster? And in the case of ClickHouse, that's generally the case. So this is a good speed if you are an analyst and you're doing OLAP type queries, slicing and dicing, you want to look at the data one way, you want to look at the data another way. You're not going to have to wait very long. 
So um, the interesting thing to do is now to see, hey, can we get this down to the level that it could actually drive something like real-time bidding for um, ad tech? And if you're familiar with ad tech, you know that the response time has to be 10 milliseconds or less. It turns out that we can do that. And what I've done is actually constructed a materialized view, which I'll talk about this in, in this talk. But it basically takes those 1.3 billion um, uh, taxi, uh, taxi rides and aggregates them by day. And when I run off the materialized view, the speed of the count, which you can see is exactly the same out to uh, 15 or so decimal places, is, um, is now uh, responds in two, in two milliseconds. So with ClickHouse, you can not only get this very high OLAP speed so that, you know, for, for completely random queries, uh, you get very, very fast uh, results for humans. You can also, by pre-aggregating, get results that are fast enough that they can serve the needs of machines. So, so I, I don't know if you can talk about this, but like, yeah. are, you, are these query plans cached? Are they compared to statements? Nope, so nope. Like, nothing you're, cached. You're parsing, nope. you're binding, optimizing in, in zero. Everything. Points. Okay. There's no caching here. It's just all brute force. And in fact, that's as we look into the features of ClickHouse, it's really important to, to realize that it's kind of like if you were going to say what kind of car is ClickHouse, it is a drag racer. So it maybe doesn't have doors. It maybe doesn't take a lot of passengers. It maybe doesn't have gears, but it's incredibly fast. Um, it does not have to turn, put it in database terms. We don't have a query optimizer, for example like a cost-based optimizer. We do planning, but it's very basic. If you want to do the plan a different way, you have to tell ClickHouse what you want. So uh, again, it's, a, it's a what you see is what you get kind of, kind of product. Again, maybe you'll get into this in the talk, but are your, are your catalogs transactional? Are yes. They, okay. Yeah. So, so that, let me so dive query, in then. So that, oh, okay. go ahead. I would say for that query, no. you're starting a transaction to do a lookup to get the, you know, the, the map, the table name to the table object. Yeah. So you think like, like 0.002 seconds includes committing a transaction that did that lockup? Actually, there's no, there's, there's the, the, transaction, the transactional overhead is very, very minimal in the system. We don't have a fully acid transaction model. That's yeah. another place where we save. And in fact, we, the notion of having transactions at the row level does not exist in ClickHouse. And that's a, a great segue. I'm going to dive into the talk and actually explain the features of ClickHouse that, um, that allow us to do this. So now you sort of understand why it is that people care about ClickHouse, and it's the speed that really gets people um, that, to say, I gotta look at that. But there's another, a number of other things that I think are, are just interesting at the top level. First of all, it's a C++ binary. It's very, very simple architecture. There's just one binary, you run it, and that's your server. It's kind of like MySQL. It talks SQL, has a shared nothing architecture, so compute and storage are bound on a bunch of, particularly as you, as you scale it out. They're bound together, sort of like uh, the original Vertica architecture. Column storage with vectorized query execution. It has built-in sharding and replication, and it's released under an Apache 2.0 license. And one thing that um, about the C++ that I should note is it is unusually well-written C++. I'm not a C++ programmer. I did not write any of the code in this, in this uh, server, but when I get stuck on ClickHouse, I go read the code. It's excellent, and you can figure out what's going on and, and you know, sort of reason about what it's doing. So that's the basic feature set. Um, let me tell a little bit about the history of, of ClickHouse. Uh, it's been around for a long time. One of the reasons that it's so capable is, in fact, it has the necessary decade of experience uh, of people hammering on it. It started with a, as a simple group by prototype uh, written by Alexei Milovidov, who is the main committer. And uh, this was basically to solve a problem of doing funnel analytics on their, on their website and to understand, hey, where do people drop out? Uh, you know, what is it that interests people on the site? It was sufficiently successful that by 2011, they had it deployed and it was underlying a product called Yandex Metrica, which is kind of Yandex's version of um, Google Analytics. And so for the next five years or so, it ran, a bunch, it ran Metrica and a bunch of internal apps, and it just kept expanding out to more use cases until in 2016, um, Milovidov managed to persuade his management to release it under Apache 2.0. And the, um, the, the reason that it was um, uh, released was it was uh, 
you know, Yandex felt, hey, we got something pretty cool. We want people to see what kind of technology we can do. And, and, uh, and they went ahead and released it. From then on, things happened pretty quickly. There was some uh, things like there was the blog Flare article or Cloudflare article about um, how they were using it for their DNS analytics, followed by another one, uh, web analytics. There was a, a uh, 1.1 billion taxi rides benchmark by Galco Mark Litwinchik, and it began to uh, things began to move forward pretty quickly thereafter. So at that point, um, it began to get some. Uh, you know, some real uh, mindshare in the United States. And as of 2020, we're, we're now working forward to try and, um, to, you know, to sort of increase worldwide adoption, but in particular to get a, to get a really strong presence in the U.S. So um, I apologize, there's, I've got a menu bar at the bottom, which uh, Windows, I knew I should not have run on Windows, but it's misbehaving today. So um, here, let me. It, let me it's just, fine. I'm just going to keep going. All right. So why is it fast? I think there's two types of things that ClickHouse does that, that make it really great. One is the code is itself is optimized from speed. Um, if you can make anything faster uh, in the code, it's, ClickHouse is going to do it. So for example, instead of having uh, abstract interfaces that point down to algorithms, the interfaces are all based on what is it the algorithms need. So for example, we don't have uh, if you need initialization to make something go fast, well, that's got to be in your public interface. There's also a huge amount of specialization. So group by, there's 14 different algorithms. Um, there's other types of specializations here. And Alexei Milovedov has a great talk where he describes how it is that they, that they think about the optimization of the code. And then finally, we have vectorized query execution. So we need at least SSE 4.2 on, um, on the chips we run on. Um, and then it has very efficient dispatch across all available cores. So if you run this on a, um, you know, sort of on a, on, a, uh, on a machine with 16 cores and you run HTOP, you're going to see them pretty much light up uh, to 100% when, when these queries run. So this is at the – yeah, can, go ahead. Can you, talk, can you talk about that multi-arm bandit for the LZ4? Yeah, uh, so LZ4, there's, uh, multiple, um, there's multiple algorithms to uh, do LZ4 decompression. And so what they actually do is do some sampling uh, beforehand, and they use that to pick an appropriate uh, algorithm to, for the decompression. The differences are not huge, but uh, again, in this, I recommend this talk number four. Uh, it has a great example of how they go about um, doing, that, uh, doing that optimization. And it's, it's dynamic based on the data they're looking at. So let me go into how ClickHouse works internal. So this is a SQL database. It has tables. And the workhorse table engine is something called Merge Tree. As you'll see, ClickHouse has a bunch of table engines. But this is the main one that this and its variants are the main ones that people use. So if, you, if you're familiar with SQL, you see create table on time. You see some data types. You then see this engine merge tree that says, hey, I want, I want this particular way of managing data. You've also got a partition key, which says, hey, I'm going to break it up by the, and this is flight data, as it turns out, flight on time data. Break it up by the month, and within the, uh, these parts, as we call them, order it by carrier and flight date. So this is, a typical, uh, this is a typical table definition. And what it creates in storage is this, um, merge tree layout, which consists of a bunch of parts. And the parts are chunks of data, which are indexed. So they have a sparse index, which, uh, uh, and by sparse, I mean it only has entries for every, so 8,000 or so uh, uh, rows by default. And then the columns are all, all the data is, is ordered in columns, and they're both sorted and compressed. So this is the so when you look at a table, you'll just see these parts as a directory on disk, and then you'll see a bunch of files underneath that contain the, the innards. So what I'm going to do next is going to look inside the layout because this is of one of these parts because this is really the heart of how ClickHouse is so fast. So here's the sparse index. It's in a file called primary.idx, and the idea is that every 8,196 uh, rows you're going to have an entry in the index. And the distance between rows is called a granule. So that means that you, in fact, one of the properties is that you only, you always, you're always going to read 8,000, the equivalent of 8,000 rows at once. Then over in the columns, each column is going to have two files. 
Um, one's a .mrk file. That is an array that contains pointers that relate the granules. So granule number three is then related in each case to a, uh, a segment inside the bin file, and that's a compressed block. And so the marks enable us to quickly say, hey, you know, if we want to read uh, granule number three, go look in the mark file, and then, hey, here's the offset inside that bin file where you need to go to start decompressing data. So, so this is the basic layout, and for most, for almost all data where you want to do um, scan it quickly, this is how it's going to be organized. So one of the things that, one of the problems that you get in these systems is that they, they have very large amounts of data, and in order to get large amounts of data in, you're going to have to put it in pretty fast. So ClickHouse is, is optimized to allow the data to be inserted as quickly as possible and then reorganize later so that it's more efficient for query. So if I insert data into this table, what's gonna happen is every time I do an insert, it's going to take whatever I inserted, say a block of 1,000 rows or 10,000 rows or 100,000, and it's gonna create a part. And that's instantly queryable. So as soon as that insert completes, ClickHouse can, I have two inserts, maybe they complete in parallel, I can immediately do a select count and it's gonna show those um, it's gonna show the data. However, this isn't particularly efficient because you saw that structure, there's a lot of little files. And so if I have to read a lot of parts to do this count or to do whatever query I'm doing, I'm actually going to spend a lot of time in, you know, sort of manipulating storage. So what ClickHouse does is uh, what are called background merges, where from time to time it examines the parts and then it basically uh, puts them together in a new part and in an atomic operation just does a switcheroo so that then queries from then on use the, use the collapsed part. And so the idea is you get sort of a quick but half-hearted uh, organization of the data going in, which means it's instantly queryable, and then over time it becomes more and more efficiently distributed so that your queries run as fast as possible. And this is a really fundamental uh, fundamental behavior of, of the ClickHouse server and is one of the reasons why you can have very rapid ingest but also highly efficient reads. So there's, there's no global yeah. catalog state that says like, like every, every, it shared nothing so every node basically has the information on what it contains but there's no like global consistency guarantees across the different shards. No, no and in fact um, I'll talk about replication a little bit but it's um, yeah, so the the sharding and, and sh the, the replication model is um, multi-master eventually consistent um, with Zookeeper used as a uh, source of the consensus on what are the parts that actually need to be replicated. But that's actually a, a major, that's a, a major design um, point in this system that we're, we're eventually consistent. And in fact, another thing, since we're talking about transactions, and I promised we'd say something about this, but the unit, the transactional unit in ClickHouse is the part. The individual parts are written atomically, so it either entirely goes out or, or not. Um, there's no notion of being able to do a transaction at the level of a row. So when we change things, for example, uh, when we delete data, for example, we actually have to rewrite the parts typically to, to get the data deleted. And that's the, that's the unit of, of transactional work. And then when you do the merge, that's when you actually you know, do the more heavyweight compression. Yes. Well, actually, what will happen is the compression, um, the, 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 what, the, the efficiency, the place where we really get the efficiencies, the compression is the same. It's just you have longer ranges of data. And so more chance for data based on your sorting order to be in some favorable um, ordering that will then get, get you even better con compression than what you had before. And the, the, the difference between having a lot of parts versus um, having a few can often be an order of magnitude in terms of your query speed. This is pretty simple to demonstrate. Um, and in fact, speaking of I.O., sort of the base performance of ClickHouse is just because it is fundamentally, you know, we don't use a lot of tricks. We're, we're basically just doing brute force reads for most things. So the more we have to read, the slower we go. So if you can, so what you're always trying to do in ClickHouse is to take your, your query and minimize the amount of data that you're, you're traversing when you um, when you run, and this is a simple example that just shows query response uh, and and the number of marks that we read. So this is airline data. It's a very simple example. I don't include a join 
Um, but what we're doing is we're, first of all, reading all of the marks. So that's everything that's, you know, every, every block and every column that we need to look at to, to get this query result. And we can see that it takes 0.4 seconds. If we can restrict it to a year, it's going to take much less. And if we restrict it to 40 days, it gets even less. And ClickHouse is fairly intelligent about this where clause. It's fairly intelligent because it knows that that's actually can be related to the partition key. And it's able to avoid even looking at partitions in this case um, so that it, it further speeds up the queries. But you can see that the, the marks read and the query response are, are just one to one at this point. So beyond that, since we have good parallelization of, of CPUs, if, or excuse me, of, of the I.O., if you can add CPUs at that stage, it really helps your execution. So here's a simple example. Again, another query, but with a group by and, and order by. Um, and what we're doing is trying it with different numbers of hardware threads. Max threads is a, is a setting that says, hey, how many cores do you use? So these are anything you can see in proc, uh, vCPU. That's a core, so we do it at two, four, six, eight. And what we see is that at two, you know, we get a certain level. If, if we double it, it pretty much, uh, you know, doubles the performance, but then it, it drops off asymptotically. So you're beginning to see sort of an Amdahl effect in, the, in six and eight. And that's because you're probably spending some time grouping, you know, finishing the group by and uh, doing, your, doing your sort, and then burping out the, the 10 rows that you found at the top. So, um, so this, but generally speaking, if you want to speed something up, you want to, re, you know, reduce the amount of I.O. and apply more CPUs, and then you'll get faster throughput. So up till now, I think this is fairly, you know, there's a lot of databases that do this, but what's interesting then is that's just the base performance. You get that stuff. What I just showed you, you get that by doing nothing, just by defining a table and running the queries. ClickHouse has a boatload of performance features, and this is kind of an eye chart. And I was, I felt kind of bad about it because there were more that I wanted to, there were more things that I really wanted to put in here. These are just some of the big ones. Uh, so LZ4 and SDD, uh, ZSDD compression, that's uh, LZ4 is default. Uh, we, we do our best to cache the primary key index as well as those mark indexes. Uh, we can do sampling, we can do skip indexes. These are indexes which are kind of like bloom filters, for example. There is in fact one that is based on bloom filters, they try and knock out things to read. So it's all devoted to reduce the amount of uh, marks we have to read and within them maximize the amount of data that we get out of each one. What I'm gonna do is actually zero in on just two of these to give you a flavor for how they work. I'm gonna look at codex and compression and I'm gonna look at materialized views. These are two of the more popular, more popular features in ClickHouse that people use for speed. Before you jump into that, quickly, yeah. the, the specialized engines, is it like, yes. the, like the MySQL in the 2000s where everyone had these sort of off-brand random engines? Yes, it's, it's like, that's, a great, that's a, great, a, a great analogy, and I even wanted to bring it up because it's like MySQL except the engines actually work. That's, so, what, that, that's what I was asking. Yeah, so, so MySQL, yeah, the engines are sort of a disaster. I, they had this, this elaborate interface, and of course the one engine you use is InnoDB. ClickHouse has dozens of engines. And so we're, we're looking at merge tree, but there's basically, it's fairly easy to construct new engines. Mm -hmm. And so ClickHouse has a raft of them all focused on different use cases. We'll look at at least five engines in this talk. Um, and, 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 and you'll see those as, as we go through, but it's, a very, it's been a very successful model. So uh, compression and codex, they're really simple. So here's a test. Um, a is a string, so the first one is just gonna get LZ4 compression. I can apply what's called a, a low cardinality codec on it. Um, that is going to do dictionary encoding. I then have some numbers, uh, that's column B, and then I have various combinations of using a delta encoding, you know, sort of uh, encode it by the differences in the steps. Um, double delta, which is the differences in the slope in the steps. And then you can combine those explicitly with your favorite uh, Compression. If you don't do anything, it doesn't compress. Uh, you, you actually have to specify it explicitly. But this is very simple to do, and you can just bake it into your schema. Moreover, it's pretty easy to change. Um, the important thing is how much of a difference it makes, and it can be huge. So this is one of the places where we usually go for performance tuning. 
is that, you know, somebody has a string, we'll say, hey, what's your cardinality? If it's anything under, you know, 10 or 15,000, make it low cardinality. And this is a typical example. I think this, I don't know what the cardinality was on this data. It was in the dozens. But by the time it, it um, reduced the data and then compressed it, it had knocked off 89%. So um, that's a pretty good compression ratio. The numeric encodings, like a delta encoding applied to a time series, can actually be really, really huge. So it's not uncommon, because those are, particularly if you've sorted things so that they're monotonically increasing, um, you're going to get, uh, with the delta encoding, in this particular example, we got 99.5%. And then double delta was even better because these were fairly, uh, you know, sort of integers that were increasing pretty gently. Um, we got like 99% uh, compression. So these are these have a huge impact, of course, on the amount of data that you're going to be reading. And what this means is for huge reaches of columns, you might only read a few marks. So, so that's, going to, that's going to speed up your query uh, speed. Uh, that's going to speed up your queries enormously. The other um, feature I want to zero in on just briefly is materialized views. And these are materialized views. Uh, exist in many databases. I've used them in Oracle, for example. And um, they have a somewhat, and <clears throat> they exist in, part, in Postgres, they have a kind of shaky reputation in OLTP databases because they're hard to, it's hard to get them to work. In ClickHouse, we have the advantage that stuff doesn't change very much. So materialized views get hard to maintain if you're constantly having transactions on your base data. In ClickHouse, you usually write the part, and then, yes, it gets merged later, but it doesn't, it doesn't get updated very much. And so, and so the, the, uh, the materialized views in ClickHouse are super efficient. And so the, you can think of them as kind of like synchronous post insert triggers. And they're also very flexible. So you can use them for aggregation. That's an obvious um, thing to use views for because they will um, basically, there's a, new, there's a table type called summing merge tree, which is designed to hold aggregates. It says summing merge tree, but it, it can actually be any kind of aggregate. Um, and these are optimized to hold these parts, to hold partial aggregates, which can then later be merged together. So use them for aggregation, but another thing we use them for commonly is to read from Kafka. We have a table engine for Kafka that makes, that queue, that makes the queues or the topics look like tables, and you can have a materialized view that reads from it on, at intervals and puts it in a real table. You can build pipelines because you can chain the views. You can, here's an interesting one, Last point queries are very common in time series, like what's the current CPU usage across all my VMs in the entire data center? So yes, you can solve that in a query, but that would require you to look at the entire time series for every VM in order to, uh, to get it. Um, in this case, there's actually uh, syntax in the, in the views that allow you to, to create this incredibly efficient uh, view. And in fact, the one that I'm showing here where the compressed data is 0.0009%. That's actually a last point query. And then finally, um, you can change sorting or primary key order. So sometimes it just helps to have, you know, with column stores, it just helps to have them sorted a different way. This is something that the Vertica and C store folks realized. Um, so they're kind of like, you can use it to create the equivalent of Vertica projections. People love materialized views. They're used very, very widely in, in ClickHouse implementations. So it, it sounds like it's like, it's, do you have ClickHouse specific dialect for Yes. Like it's not just general purpose SQL. You're doing something. Different. Nope. Nope. This, this is where, this is one of the places where ClickHouse really departs because they actually have a data type, which is corresponds to these, I call them partial aggregates because you can think of your views, particularly because we're, we're distributed. ClickHouse has this notion that what they'll do is compute. For example, if they have like a, if when they're doing vectorized uh, query dispatch, you know, we'll get a chunk of the array. We'll compute partial aggregates across that chunk. And so for example, if you were doing an average, it would be a value and a weight, um, which you would then pass back to be, to be fully aggregated, or we say merge somewhere else. So we actually expose those partial aggregates as a data type. It means it takes a little use, getting used to, but it's, you can do a lot of really powerful stuff with it. But then also there's no query optimizer, so it's up to the application to know that like- Precisely. Query, yeah, okay. Precisely. That's why you and in fact, it. Yeah, in fact, a lot of the optimization, I didn't talk about it here, but a lot of the optimization, because it tends to be around things like, okay, how much data do I have? How, how uh, heavily is it compressed? Uh, ClickHouse has really great system tables. 
And so what you do is there's a table, for example, called system.parts. It tells you how many parts you have, what's the overall amount of storage, system.columns, tells you all your columns and all your tables, and you can see the codecs you're using and the exact levels of compression. So you go in there and you look at it and you play around with it. So that's materialized views. These are super popular. Um, let me talk, this is the final part is, uh, we'll talk about scaling. So obviously you can scale vertically and everything that, that we've done here is, you know, talking, you know, sort of are things that the, the features I've talked about so far, you can improve their performance by adding more CPU, adding more RAM, that just gives us like having a bigger buffer cache. So when we do need to uh, do things again, we've got it, adding more storage. These all help the, the nodes grow. But at some point, you need horizontal scaling. People deal with data sets that run into tens of petabytes on ClickHouse. So ClickHouse has sharding and replication built in. So the way to think about it is the shards are, uh, they're disjoint pieces of your data set. And what you do is you break your tables up and spread them across the shards, and then the tables are grouped, and then you can replicate between tables. So you do the replication mostly because, obviously, for HA, if you lose one of the sh uh, one of the hosts, then you've still got other copies of, the, of that part of the table. Uh, but the other thing is, if you have a lot of concurrent queries, uh, ClickHouse is smart enough to to go look at them and 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 use spread the load across them. So to get this to work, there are table engines, more of them. So we start with a table, a distributed table. It's like an umbrella, and it reads a definition of the shards and the replicas, basically the hosts that they're on, and then it uses that when it processes the query to dispatch, to you know, to pick replicas to go through, to understand that hey, there are multiple shards. We need to you know dispatch the need to do federated query across them, and the other engine is replicated merge tree, which uh, and there's very there's other variants of that that are suitable for aggregation, but they basically are tables that know, that have a, a path in ZooKeeper and can share data automatically. So you can put it in any table, it will propagate asynchronously to other, other replicas. So that's the base table types. Um, yeah, here's a little bit about the, what happens is it just takes that, um, you know, the processing of parts that I showed you, and basically it now happens across replicas. So for example, when we have to do a merge, we'll use ZooKeeper to do a leader election. Actually, we, the table, at any given time, one of the table replicas is the leader, and it's responsible for deciding what to merge and when. Everybody else gets told about it, and they just follow in lockstep. Um, when you we have to do a distribute, yeah, go ahead. Not, you, like you, you made a big deal about like, oh, it's a single binary, but like yes. I mean, Zookeeper is a whole nother. Yes, yes, um, there, there is a, yes, I did make a big deal about that. And that is the one place where I kind of wish that were part of the binary as well. But on the other hand, um, I, you know, the thing that there is a problem, I think this was a practical decision to use Zookeeper. It worked well enough. Uh, there's been murmurings over the years about replacing this with etcd, which I think would probably just give us a different set of problems. Um, long term, maybe you'd want to have it just baked into the, uh, you know, baked into the um, to the core service process. But as you know, that's something you don't do hastily. Yeah, so I want to uh, mention um, Kafka. I think in their project metamorphosis, they just announced that they're also moving away from Zookeeper to just yeah. the, uh, use the ref protocol directly on Kafka, since you already have capability on yeah. the engine itself to store the uh, metadata and catalog. Right, right. I Yeah, and I think over time, that's something that, uh, I, this is a place where ClickHouse could use some optimization um, uh, or improvements. Um, around ZooKeeper, so how does it manage consensus? And then a closely related topic, which is what is the transaction model? So I said that the, the fundamental unit that you manipulate in a transaction is the part, but there are also cases where, for example, if you have chained materialized views and something breaks halfway through writing to them, you don't necessarily clean up completely. So there's definitely, there's definitely some work that can be done in that area. Um, distributed queries, so how do they work? Well, the application comes in, it just says, hey, it goes to the on-time distributed table, and we call that the initiator node. On-time is going to look at the, that, that engine is going to look at the query, and then it's going to look up, okay, where are the shards that I need to go to, and it's going to do a federated query across them. So um, 
typically what will happen is um, if you have like a bunch of if you have like a bunch of joins, the leftmost join will get dispatched typically down to the um, uh, down to the uh, bottom query. Uh, depending on how you do it, you can control how much gets pushed down. Um, but what we'll do is we'll compute our aggregates in the ideal case. All the aggregate states get computed locally and then will be brought back up to on time and then your final aggregation will be done there and passed back. That's where your merging is done. Is there any kind of like uh, scheduler or like priority queues at this or is it just best effort? Uh, it's best effort. So yeah, if something, there are, you know, sort of practical things like, hey, if somebody is, if we detect that a replica is uh, lagging, for example, um, you can have a setting which says, hey, what's the, what's the maximum lag that you will have? And I think this is a really big thing about ClickHouse, which is, you know, why I said it's kind of like a drag racer, uh, you know, it doesn't have doors. Um, if you want to change the, particularly for distributed behavior, ClickHouse doesn't have a cost-based optimizer and let alone one that, that is distributed, you know, sort of aware of state across the cluster. So it's basically going to try to do essentially what you tell it to do. There are, um, here, and I'll, and I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. So read performance, when you get this set up right, it's great. Um, this is an example of something I ran for a webinar a while back. Uh, the, the performance is linear. If you can push as much, if you can push most of the query work down into the, into the individual shard tables, it just tears. So this is basically an example of two runs, one, one cold, one hot there. I had the, I was allowing the caches and it's, it's linear scaling. So, and for very large data sets, this, this type of, you know, where you're mostly working on a single large fact table, this is typical behavior. Um, for very fast queries, you know, like if you're trying to get down into the, you know, sort of below 10 milliseconds, network latency is going to, you know, just your setup of calls and things like that is going to, may dominate these effects and you wouldn't see a big difference. Um, you know, I said ClickHouse is not, isn't, doesn't have a query optimizer, but it does do distributed joins. Um, as long as you, uh, you have to give it direction. There's a keyword called global, which you can use to say where to go get things. But generally speaking, the default behavior is if you have a query like the one that shows up, shown at the top, if that hits the initiator, it's going to run something that looks like what's on the left. It'll basically go down and, and run it. Um, just push that whole, it'll break up the subquery for as many shards that it has, find replicas for each one, and just push the subquery down to the local table. You can, however, force it to, um, to actually do a global join. So instead of using T2, like if you're, um, you know, if you've got two tables here, if the keys are not aligned on each host, you can actually push it down and force it to do a global query on the, um, you know, on the, um, on the uh, node where it's executing. And then finally, you can actually force it to do a broadcast where it's going to run that select A from T2 first, and then basically broadcast it out. It gets stuck in a temp table, and then um, the, the, the nodes will um, join against that temp table. No magic here, though. There's uh, query settings as well as a, the global keyword, which allows you to control this behavior. So you have to know you have to know what you're doing. The good news is that's that's bad. The good news is it's not too hard to figure out what ClickHouse is doing. It has a very good query log, and you just go look there. If you're not seeing what you like, you uh, you uh, rewrite your query. So I know you guys are only going till 5:30, so I'm almost done. Uh, I promised I would talk about use cases. There's a bunch of them. Um, I'm not going to read them for you, but where ClickHouse really has a sweet spot is any case where you have very large amounts of structured data and a uh, simple example, um, network flow logs, those contain about 16 columns, but they're pervasive throughout uh, content delivery networks as well as uh, 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 public, public and private clouds, so on and so forth. Whenever you have a case where you have very large numbers of records, and you want to get results very quickly, either human quick, which means that seconds to do uh, slicing and dicing queries, or machine quick, where you need to get results in milliseconds, ClickHouse is ideal for this. And so the, we see uh, a huge amount of penetration. I'm just saying the network management uh, case, every single network company that I've talked to, in the end, even if they said they weren't using ClickHouse, we sooner or later found somebody that was actually using it. 
So it's, it's, it's very, very popular. Um, so these are, these are typical examples, um, and, and there are many more, but I think uh, lots of good examples of that, and lots of companies that have talked about using it this way. Um, current and future work, there's lots of, there's, we have hundreds of people in the community who are committing. Most of the commits are, uh, are done through Yandex as well as our team, um, but these are just a few of the areas where people are, are working. Our company, for example, is actively working on object storage. Uh, long term, we feel very strongly we, we need to, for cloud operation, we need to de decouple compute and storage. So kind of obvious uh, things there. Uh, getting better OLAP support. So for example, for window functions, there's a cry gun out in the community. Uh, merge joints, so we can do distributed joints uh, between large tables, for example. Uh, all the way down to machine learning and, and performance. A lot of our work at at Altinity has actually been around cloud native operation, uh, basically leveraging Kubernetes as the cluster manager so that we can, uh, you know, sort of effectively spin up and spin down clusters very quickly and use pools of resources to, uh, to basically enable multiple uh, clusters as opposed to a single monolithic cluster. And then there's much, much more. Uh, if you go out and look at the uh, uh, the release notes for current releases, you'll, it's amazing how much stuff has been done. Um, so the resources, these are just some things, and I'll send these slides out. I think the one of the slides is Secrets of ClickHouse Performance Optimizations. If you like database internals, this is a wonderful talk. Um, there's a couple of really good talks, that uh, blog articles that got this on the map, and then our own humble uh, contribution earlier this year, we showed how we were able to, uh, to beat a ScyllaDB, uh, I think they had like 80 nodes in their cluster and you know they, they were getting a billion rows a second. We, uh, we did it on a nuke. So that hit Hacker News and was, caused some interesting discussion. And that's it. So uh, I have to remember to say we are hiring. I've got about seven positions open. If you like databases, then uh, you'll like what we're doing. I've, I've worked on a bunch of databases, and I think of all the 20 that I can think of, the two that are closest to my heart are Sybase, where I had the, the honor to work for most of the 90s, and this one are the two most interesting ones. So it's a really, it's a really fun project to work on, great code, really great community, and a lot of really interesting applications. I, I, is there is the HQ in in the valley, or are you guys distributed? At this point? No, we're fully distributed. We're kind of like a, you know because we're open source folks, so we're actually a Delaware company. Uh, have have a subsidiary in the UK, but basically it's between my life, you know my office in Berkeley and the Ural Mountains in, in Russia. Okay. So, okay. Awesome. Uh, so they, they can email you directly. You send send their CV. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. So. Uh, I mean, I'll thank you on behalf of everyone else. You can click the, or the clapping button, but that's, again, an empty gesture. Um, so we can open up to the floor. If anybody has any questions, uh, we can go to 5.30. Panos, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. This is Panos Kersansen, University of Pittsburgh. Again, interesting talk. You have stressed uh, a couple of times that uh, you don't use any cost-based optimizer, and yet you are getting this uh, fantastic performance. But isn't it true that actually you have a human-based optimizer? Correct. And what is the effort? Yeah, that's... To, because the way that I understood, it requires some sophistication even to come up with these uh, partial aggregates and come up with the ways to build them towards final aggregation with joints. It requires a lot of effort. That's, that's true. And I think what, we're, what I've typically... And, and I can't say that, um, let me think how to answer this. I think at the current state of usage of ClickHouse, it hasn't been a huge problem because a lot of people, particularly in the United States, are early adopters and they're just interested in the, in the technology. And ClickHouse gives you a couple of tools that you can use to, um, to, to understand what's happening. One is there's a text query log along with a a query log table that shows you the queries and, and a lot of statistics about them. So for example, you know, did I use the index? Um, it's kind of like the equivalent of, of a query plan, only a bit more readable actually than a typical query plan. So you can use that. And then the second thing is you have the system tables. 
which allow you to see the level of compression, uh, the amount of space that you're using, um, you know, the number of concurrent queries. So yes, it's correct that people are, are solving these, uh, you know, have to, have to use their effort to solve it. I think a lot of the use cases also involve very, very large fact tables with a relatively small number of dimensions. And so just in terms of the, the complexity of the queries and the difficulty, it's, it's just less than what you would get in a typical Oracle application. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I, I can see that, but still uh, the way that uh, uh, my gut feeling says is that like building, you have a tool for uh, uh, application specific development. Mm -hmm. And basically your the database uh, designer is your database administrator that has to set everything for your end users to become right. effective users. So I yeah. was wondering what, if you, from your experience, what is the average time to develop such an application? Uh, that's an interesting question. What I see happening in the field is something like what happened with MySQL, where when MySQL arrived in the early 2000s, what happened was a bunch of devs turned into develop, database developers, and they wrote a bunch of crappy applications. <laughs> Uh, which, which they then, you know, which other people then spent years, um, you know, in, in some cases, then did a lot of work to, to deconstruct. But I think one of the things that's, ClickHouse is simple enough because it doesn't have a query optimizer, and it doesn't, um, you know, do a lot of magic. It's relatively easy for people, and it's and it's relatively straightforward to set up and run. It allows people who aren't necessarily deep database specials specialists to get something working and. The fact that you can set up a single cluster for every different application means that you don't have to have, this thing isn't a monolith, right? You can, the, our vision actually for how you should use this is you set up a cluster for each specific service that needs, the, that needs uh, analytics. And all you have to do is optimize for that particular application and not others. And I think that simplifies the management problem to, you know, to a sufficient degree that it makes it accessible to a lot more developers. At the same time, I think you're right that without some level of, you know, decent query optimization, there's, you know, there's a, there's going to be a limit to the number of people that we can reach. And I think one of our challenges is to develop that optimization in the future so that we can, we can reach that larger audience. Thank you. I have some more questions, but I would leave other people to jump in and then uh, we can Steven, continue. You, Steven, do you have a question? Uh, I've looked at ClickHouse because we've been uh, exploring other options. Uh, we use some yeah. commercial OLAP systems, and there are a lot of talk with Presto. And certainly, I think in the network environment, like Spark SQL with their work on Delta Lake and Apple really sort of emphasis, hey, since Spark's such a good in-memory processing system, let's throw all the traffic load and use Spark to crank on it. Sort of how does ClickHouse compare to those type of systems in terms of approaches and uh, implementations? Um, well, Spark certainly, um, Spark is just a completely different architecture. Um, and I think that the one of the one, I think one of the big distinctions that we get is between people that, you know between systems that work off data lakes versus systems that that are that force you to place the to organize uh, the data in memory along the lines of of that product. We're in the latter case. So what that means is that for very very large. Um, uh, you know, like you compare us against anything that does federated query, anything that's reading out of S3, we're not necessarily as efficient as they are or not able to operate easily at the scale that they sometimes need to operate at. But on the other hand, the trade-off is that we get much faster performance. So, for example, we do, um, one of the things we are looking at is the ability to read things like Parquet as, um, as a format, which would then give us some ability to, you know, to have a consistent data format across multiple across multiple products. That's definitely something we're very interested in. Uh, but but I think that we are fundamentally um, different in the sense that we do require you to put the data into our system. And I I even as we go to you know like sort of use S three, I don't see that that's going to change because 
so much of our performance is dependent on the organization of the data. Um, you know, the, the specific way that we do compression, for example, that allows us to minimize IO. Thank you. All right, Panas, you, you want one more question? Yeah, I, so one comment and one question. Actually, when I was uh, following your discussion, it reminded me the maybe my uh, graduate student years where we were uh, trained to do physical design organization, to start thinking about how you partition your data and how you build indexes and what uh, uh, materialized views you need to build in order to make the system run efficiently. So I, right. that's why I ask you that and in some respect, these were the challenging part of databases that have not to construct nested queries. It's how to come up with this, this physical design yes. that will deliver the speed yeah. that we were competing between our teams. How right. to do the best uh, design? I I think in the end that's always that's always something that you you struggle with. And if and if I can say this in terms of you know comparing this with other databases, I think that one of the things that's kind of interesting about ClickHouse is it actually has relatively few knobs on it that you need to adjust to get good performance. You get very good performance out of the box. Um, other systems, for example, that have um, cost-based optimizers tend to have a lot of settings that have to be set correctly for the optimizer to work. I've seen this, for example, on Oracle, mm -hmm. um, where there's a great deal of detail con uh, configuration that has to be correctly done. Otherwise, the optimizer won't, won't give you good mm -hmm. results. So I think there's a balance here. And that I, my problem with, I, I like uh, query optimizers and I like having you know, the work done for me, but then there's always cases where I feel like, hey, if I just understood what I was doing, I could actually solve the problem faster. So, um, so it's an interesting balance. And I think as we go forward, the places, what we're, what we're hearing from our users is not so much, we need a query optimizer or we need it to, the physical implementation should be easier. It's, hey, just give us window functions, please. <laughs> you know, because it, it makes us easier, to, it makes it easier to write queries in a, in a way that we understand and are comfortable with from other products. Interesting. So my other question, which was again a clarification, uh, uh, Andy asked you about uh, if you have a catalog and you said no, yet you don't have a scheduler, but still you try to do the kind of load balancing when you partition and do replication. And uh, somehow I miss that connection there how you Great. can still ensure things without getting to a bottleneck or skew data uh, distributions with the... Uh, great, yeah. great question. Um, the, most of the scheduling in that sense is just done through heuristics. So for example, when we're, um, when we are, uh, when we're scheduling a query or when we're planning a query to the extent we plan it uh, for in a distributed table, we have choices. Uh, for example, if the replica if, if we can use the local replica, should we prefer that as opposed to finding the same, you know, a replica of the same data, but on another host? Uh, what's the load balancing algorithm that we use? It's typically just round robin. These are all just settings. Um, so those are, these are all done through heuristics. They're not based on having a catalog with, um, with um, analytic, you know, with, with any sort of anal analysis of the underlying data. And one other thing that I think is important to, to say about ClickHouse is, and this is probably, I, I think in large clusters, the single biggest issue that people run into, we do not rebalance data automatically. So if I have, if you use Cassandra, mm -hmm. if I pop a host into the rack, Cassandra will, because it's using consistent That's hashing, is right. gonna spread the data out. Yeah. And um, in ClickHouse, not the case. Um, if you're using time series, what will happen and you're load balancing, it will gradually fill the host up. But um, you know, you actually have to do work to make sure that the data gets propagated. And if you take a shard away, for example, because you want to reduce the overall number of hosts in the rack and the number of VMs that you're running, you actually have to move the data manually off that shard. This, I think, is that's actually one of the big challenges that that we need to to address. And and I think that one of the ways that we can solve it is to you know, stop using the attached storage and instead use things like um, like object storage, which isn't directly attached to a single host. Okay, now I got it. 
Yeah, uh, good. Thank you. Any more questions? Andy, you are on mute. You cannot hear you. Yeah, I'm an idiot. Sorry. Um, yeah, well, one quick question, then we'll go. Um, of the, like, can you roughly say, like, how many of the operators are actually vectorized, or is everything vectorized? Like, are oh, it's, it, it's pretty hit or miss. You know, I, I was actually going through the code to just see, okay, what's, what is vectorized and what is not. Um, it's pretty much, I don't, th I could not say what the pattern is. Uh, a lot of the vectorization is actually done in libraries that we uh, that we use. Um, you know, so we have you know like vectorized uh, mathematical operations, things like that. Um, I think this has really been something which it kind of gets to the point you've made in a lot of your lectures that a hey, vectorization is something that has to be done kind of carefully. Um, and the so I think that a lot of the pattern is a result of Milovidov and other people in the community trying operations, finding out, you know, like, hey, this could be vectorized because, you know, hey, you know, it's, a, it's an array. We, you know, we don't have a lot of problems with, you know, we could also minimize branch mispredictions. So we're going to go ahead and vectorize this and, um, and do it. But I don't think there's a systematic pattern that you could really point to. It's just okay. wherever it seemed to make it faster. Okay. All right. Cool. Awesome. All right. So again, we're, we're very happy to have Robert come talk about ClickHouse. As I said, it's a system we've been wanting to learn more about. So this has been super insightful.